Okay, welcome to Let's Talk About Cybersecurity Essentials. This is a class that I'm currently teaching that is brought to us by, uh, by uh, the Cisco Networking Academy. This is Chapter 1. Chapter 1 is a world of wizards, heroes, and criminals. This is just a brief overview of uh, the cybersecurity world and what to expect and what the terminology is. Chapter 1. Okay, so in this chapter we're going to cover the characteristics of uh, cybersecurity world, criminals, cybersecurity professionals, comparing the threats and also the growth factor and why you should get into cybersecurity. The cybersecurity world. Okay, first of all, uh, cybersecurity covers everything from websites, but primarily the power of data. And like anything else, all the companies and all the resources are actually broken down into kingdoms. So you have kingdoms would be like Google, LinkedIn, Amazon, to just give you an example. Um, and unfortunately, with the growth of kingdoms are going to be the growth of hacking as well. Cyber wizards track technology. They track uh, what's happening. They monitor what's, everything that's going on out there. They can also do global or GSI and the Internet of Everything and the Internet of Things are going to be the biggest error problem areas that are coming up. Uh, the growth of collecting information and data, everybody puts everything on the web, which is always not a good thing to do. Like I've always mentioned before in all my lectures, if you can't write it on a, on a poster board and hold it over your head in traffic, don't put it up on the cloud or web. Cyber criminals versus professionals. Okay, here in this aspect we have what are called hackers. Hackers are brought to you in different categories. White hackers are the ones that protect more than uh, attack. Gray hackers are the ones in between. I would consider myself a gray hacker. And black hackers or black hats are the hackers that do unethical and criminal and also violate and try to get into systems. Each one has their purposes. A lot of times a black hat hacker will get in trouble with the law and turn into a white hacker or I mean white hat or vice versa. Okay, on the lower end there are uh, some things out there that uh, kind of classify them and here's one is called a, a script kitty. This is usually teenagers or hobbyists or most people that just don't just play around with it don't really intend to do anything dangerous on it. Then you have what are called vulnerability brokers. They are typically gray hatter, hackers who try to get into products or try to get into vendors and then go to the vendor or website and ask, here's what I did, can I get something for it? And then you have what are called hackivists. Hackivists are gray hackers who rally and protect against uh, digital politics and social ideas. Hackivists are primarily targeting like government and organizations and help defend their causes or needs. And then of course you have what are called uh, the higher end ones and one of these would be cyber criminals and these are black hackers and they uh, work on different things to try to get into websites, servers and they also steal billions of dollars from the consumer and businesses. Now this is probably one of the more I guess dangerous ones. These are called state-sponsored hackers. These are foreign countries that pay organizations, groups, or people to try to attack uh, other nations, I, I guess, infrastructures. Uh, I'm sure that the U.S. has state, uh, also their own state-sponsored ones. They pretty much have to. But these are where like countries will go in and try to uh, disable power structures, infrared structures, or whatever that will harm the most people online. Okay, and if you ever wanted to know uh, more information about it or how to thwart these, there are certain things. There are uh, there are like vulnerability databases or VCE uh, databases, and here's a, here's here's the website where you can get those on vulnerabilities. They also have early warning systems. Uh, this is called the Honey Net Project. Uh, uh, these are like honey pots where you expect these areas of your website to be hacked so you can see what they're doing to hack you and then you can secure your main uh, your main site up. 
And then here's one that people share information about being hacked or getting hacked by intelligence and also help to prevent hostile attacks. There are some standards out there that are being used currently. One of them is the ISO 27000 standard, and this is an information security management standard. There's also new laws that are coming out constantly that try to protect people. Uh, vulnerability databases, early warning systems, shared security, and the new laws. This is kind of like the current circle of defense to help protect you and me and everybody else against attacks. Threats to the kingdom. Okay, so we have uh, threat areas or arenas, and one of them would be the wizards. Uh, the, the wizards are the insight, and they recognize and influence the harmless, and they also build the organization and protect the people from cyber attacks. Wizards also recognize the threat that data poses if used against people, and uh, they basically do just like they do in King Arthur's Day. They protect the kingdom with magic or so to speak magic, to protect the people using spells and programs and whatever they need to keep things out. The following examples are a few sources that are highly targeted. Personal information, always personal information. Medical records, education records, and employee and finance records are probably the ones on here. Uh, your data is your data and it should be your data but unfortunately the more hackers get the more they can sell them for and make money off of you left and right and that is where um, you get a tax from and that's why they go after credit card companies and finance companies okay threats against these they can go against uh, uh, your DNS server, your HTTP server or online databases they can use packet sniffers which actually sniff the traffic going in and out of your system and they can see where you're going, what ports you're using, and a lot of times see your username and password, which is actually the worst thing. They also can do what are called packet forgeries, and this is where they actually take your packet out and they replace it with something that they want. They get the information back and then they forward you a bogus response. And this is also called a man-in-the-middle attack. This is where you have somebody in between intercepting information as it goes from point A to point B, replacing it what what they want, getting what they want, and then sending you what you think you would be uh, you would be receiving. Okay, let's look at uh, the sectors of kingdom. We have the manufacturer sector, automation industry, energy production and distribution, communication and transportation. All of these, all of these make up our key infrastructure. But if any one of these gets compromised or damaged, so to speak, or if the gates are overwhelmed because it is a kingdom, they can uh, uh, bring down all of them. So just be aware of that. Okay, on a personal level, everybody needs to safeguard his or her information. Uh, it is your responsibility to be safe. Uh, the NSA can help with, with the national standards, but people need to realize that they are responsible for their own way of life. And believe it or not, the most easiest way hackers or anybody gets into a system is poor passwords. Make sure you have a secure password. And yes, I know it can be a pain having to remember or always look up a password, but I would prefer to actually look up a harder password than to try to get money that was stolen out of my bank account because I used an easy password. So please keep that in mind when considering a password. And a lot of companies are actually now forcing you to create a hard password so to, or one that's more difficult using characters, underscore, letters, 12 characters minimum, and those kind of things like that. So just be careful that you as a individual and an employee are responsible for your data and content. The dark forces of cybersecurity. Woohoo! Okay, so let's look at the dark forces. The dark forces are primarily in two categories, internal security threats and external security threats. The most common is internal security threats. And like I mentioned before, this could be your bad 
password, easy password. Uh, shoulder surfing, which means people that are looking over your shoulder what you're doing. Key loggers that tracks what you type and do on your systems and so forth. External threats can be from the outside, amateur or skilled attackers that exploit vulnerabilities in a network. They also use social engineering. They go, uh, they go dumpster diving and external traffic, uh, external attackers exploit weaknesses in, in uh, the program. And a lot of times those weaknesses are called zero day attacks or, or, a zero, or a zero hour or zero day of vulnerabilities. They are vulnerabilities that are known by the publisher but have not yet been patched. That is one reason why recently you've been getting a lot more security updates from all of your sources, whether it be uh, Windows, Apple, Android, whatever. Uh, and I've said this many times, there is no such thing as a secure program. Everything has vulnerabilities and believe it or not, people and companies are out there and all they do is look for them. So we have to come up with countermeasures to kind of fight them if possible. Vulnerabilities on, on mobile devices is probably the worst thing coming out now. From what I read and tell, the most the, the most attacked item at the moment or device at the moment is your smartphone or I'm sorry your smart watch. The security to get in your smart watch is very lax and very easy and what is your smart watch usually attached to? Your smartphone. So once they get into your smart watch they can just do an escalation a privilege to your smart device and then from there, if your smart device is connected to your PC on the internet or cloud, they can do an escalation from your phone to your computer. So be aware that having things connected like Google Drive and Microsoft 365 and those things, they're very convenient to have it all the time, but it can be very detrimental if you are hacked at a lower level and they just escalate up to where you're at on your device and see everything you can see. And also, too, they also a lot of companies are also doing BYOD, which is bring your own device. Uh, that is not a good thing at the moment until you can scan every device that comes in. And trust me, that is not going to be something that's going to be easy to do. Uh, now, here is something that you're going to be seeing an awful lot about in the news. The Internet of Things, or IoT. IoT is a collection of pretty much anything connected to the Internet. So if you have a smart TV, if you have one of those smart refrigerators, uh, now they even have a smart uh, dryer, it is connected to the internet. Chances are it does not have a firewall or does not have anything to protect it from being hacked. So hackers can use it as an attack device to do DDoS attacks or denial of service attacks by redirecting its connection to its targeted location. Uh, there also are quite a bit of devices on IoT devices that are dangerous to see, like uh, uh, most baby cams are on there, most of your home security systems are on there, uh, most of your home uh, security is on there. In fact, I have a smart house, but I kind of dumbed it down a bit because I turned off streaming video and I turned off automatic door locking and unlocking. The way I look at it is I can watch my video when I want to see it and I can unlock the door when I'm here or lock the door when I'm here. So why bother doing it remotely if you don't need to? Also to remember that uh, the Internet of Things is going to get heavily, heavily policed because they need to be protected in some manner. And if the companies will not do it, I will guarantee you that the federal government will come in and do it. So just be very careful. The impact of big data. Big data has been a term that's been used out there for the last couple years. All it basically means is everything out there is data and the cloud is big data or bigger data. And the amount of it is growing exponentially and what I mean by that is Every medical record, every transaction you do when you buy gasoline, if you scan your credit card, if you do your reward zone cards, if you do any kind of source like that, it is now on the web. And chances are anything that you've ever typed in a browser 
typically is saved as well. Even if you misspelled the search you were doing, which I do many times, it is saved. Um, everything is saved for marketing purposes, supposedly what they say that for, or to get a better idea how you understand things. So just be careful that uh, everything is out there and being collected and it's getting harder to big guard big data, but it's going to be another big issue that it's going to come back around again, which was, like I said, it was it was at a couple years ago, kind of went to the far side, and, then, and now it's coming back. Okay, the sophistication of the dark forces. Uh, whew, this is hard one to cover. They have advanced persistent threats. Uh, they have uh, tools that are developed by other hackers to break algorithms, to break, uh, you know, like uh, the new dual algorithms for eGrip and those other kind of type of uh, uh, routing protocols. Uh, they can also now select victims and they can also pick what is called low-hanging fruit or the most vulnerable victims and then from there they can do what are what is called escalation of user privileges, which means they can go from a user to an admin to a web site master or whatever the case may be on that one. The broader scope is uh, that as things escalate and get more things, uh, the most common ways to protect federal identification is tying login and ability to authorize devices. Uh, what you're going to start seeing is when you log into your device now, at the moment you use what is called a single authentication method, which means you type in a username, password, and regardless of how much information you put in, you're always typing in it on one device. You're going to see like Apple's uh, uh, recognition of face and, and recognition from Google trying to come up with a key fob. That would be dual authentication process because now you have, a, you have a physical device and you have to type something in on a keyboard. Uh, but even with that though, be careful because everything can be thwarted. Hey, I use the word thwarted. Anyways, any everything can be defeated by one way or the other, and everything will just continue to grow and develop as things come in. Safe implications, like I said, they have uh, the old telephone denial of service attacks back in the day that actually actually shut down the 911 service. This is when a lot of calls came in that were not legitimate and took down the system. Now we have voice over IP or VoIP and it can do the same thing on that one. Heightening, heightening recognition of cybersecurity threats. Uh, uh, would it a smart high school or script kitty could gain access to the system? So if you remember the old War Games movie back in the 80s, they, he was able to get into their grading system and change the grade just because they left the password easily on the desk or, or in the drawer. Uh, like I mentioned before, script kitties are not as dangerous, but they can develop into being very dangerous individuals if they learn to develop their skills better. And now countries have become more aware of the threats of cyber attacks, and they also are trying to put more resources into keeping the country and economic security safer than it is now. Creating more heroes. Creating More Heroes is right now um, uh, the the National Institute of Standards and Technologies is creating a framework to, to help professionals and know exactly what they need to do. They're trying to come up with what, ti what the responsibilities would be, job titles, and workforce. This is fantastic for students because this is where the future is going to be when it comes to cybersecurity. Uh, you're going to have to know how to operate and maintain if you want to do business. Uh, protect and defend, investigate or collect information. So the way I see uh, cybersecurity is there's going to be two paths that you can take. You can either go business path, which will make it more, I guess, administrative and upper management, or you can take the IT course, which would be more of the investigation, protecting and, and defending the physical devices and keeping them safe from outside intruders. So uh, regardless of what your, uh, I guess, your interest is if you're interested in business, you can go business and technology, but everything needs to have cybersecurity regardless of the field and regardless of where you're working at or what you're doing.
And of course, here, like I said earlier about the management, you have the analyzing, the oversight and development, and in the in the in, in, in the secure uh, provisions. I guess one of the things that a lot of companies do not have is they do not have a strong security policy. A policy basically states what you can and cannot do on a company's uh, computer network, and if you break the policy, you could be fired. But if the policy is not in place, and if you do something, then if they try to fire you, they have no right to, because there is no policy that actually states you could not do that in the first place. So that's why you're going to see a lot of push on analyzing and policy development when it comes to all companies all over the world and all over the country. Here are some professional organizations that help collaborate with what's happening out there. Um, these are just uh, some that you probably have seen like InfoSec and CERT and SANS. These are ones that you've seen and these are the ones that are helping to develop the framework for all cybersecurity within organizations and within education as well. And then here are some great student organizations that you can go to. Uh, we have Cyber Patrol, we have Skills USA, which our college is a big part of. We participate in all skills of Skills USA, including uh, the networking, PC maintenance, welding, drafting. It's culinary, so we have a bunch there. Then there's a bunch of other challenges and things that you can do out there. And if you, and if you really want to get into the field, I highly recommend that you get at least the Security Plus. Uh, this is something that industry and government is requiring and needing, regardless of your degree or your skill set. It is, it is like your ticket inside of the organization. Once you get inside of there, they're going to teach you what they want you to know. But you have to have some kind of means of getting in the door. So if you do any kind of searches on cybersecurity uh, jobs or government, you're going to always see typically one of these three, either, either Security Plus, the Ethical Hacker, or the SANS uh, Security Essential Cert. Always good to have these. They all expire given in a three-year period. So always make sure you maintain them and keep them going. Here's another one you can get. You can get the CISP or the management. These two right here I highly recommend for people that are interested in a managerial positions because these are primarily based for management type level positions. These are the people that would help manage the systems, understand the basic concepts, and also develop the like I mentioned before, policies and framework that the organization would need to run. Uh, these are also harder to get, so be prepared to really study a lot for these. And of course, you have your company sponsors uh, uh, certificates. There's Cisco, Microsoft. I have Cisco. I have Microsoft. And there's a bunch of matrices you can do. I, am off, I also have my CCNA security certification as well as my security plus and I plan on keep renewing those to keep what's happening and here's an example of where you can go in in the given level and of course this is a Cisco course so they're going to primarily show you Cisco certs but to give you an example the security plus would fall here in associates and then the other ones you saw earlier like like the CSSP would go professional or expert. So just kind of like, you can always Google it, everybody does. <laughs> Nothing to be ashamed of. To be a hero, you want to learn, study, pursue the certifications, get an internship, and get a job with a company you want. Um, do, not get a, do not get a degree just because you need a degree. You need to get a degree that kind of goes along with the job lines you are doing. So if you notice on most job applications, it says uh, bachelor's in engineering or related field or associates in engineering or related field. A related field could be CS, IT, uh, BCIS. So just be aware of what you're doing. And I would highly recommend looking ahead of what you may be working for or working with. Chapter summary, okay. I know this was an awful lot to take in, and this is kind of a longer chapter, but this helped to explain the world 
and the growing data to explore the motivation of cyber criminals, which is basically to get money or to take down systems, uh, to explore the dark forces, uh, to how to become a hero to defend the dark forces and also the kingdoms, the resources available to help create more heroes. It explains cybersecurity professionals and the same skills that the, the criminals have. When I teach my courses, I try to teach them how to do certain things because you cannot prevent something if you don't know how it's done. So just be aware of that as well. And also to resources and additional pages that you would need um, for it. Like I mentioned before, my name is Robert Doyle, and I appreciated your time, and I hope you got something out of this. Thank you very much.